Good evening, everybody. I'm Susan Denson Guy. I'm the executive director here at the Emerson Center for the Arts and Culture. I'd also like to introduce uh, Tamara Knappenberger, our events and membership manager, and our behind the scenes guru for this evening. I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us. And before we begin our program, we'd like to take a moment to pause. We'd like to pause to acknowledge that the Emerson Center for the Arts and Culture occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Absalaga, Salish Kootenai, and the Cheyenne. We honor all of the indigenous caretakers of these lands, waters, and the elders who lived here before, the indigenous of today, and the generations to come. At this time, we'd like to invite each of you to follow the link that we placed in the chat, so that you can share with us the traditional lands that you're joining us from this evening. Thanks to COVID, that stinker. Thanks to COVID, we've had quite a few virtual artist talks this past 18, 19 millennium months. That said, we ask for a little grace and latitude as we navigate this virtual forum. If you have any technical difficulties this evening, we suggest that you exit and then re-enter the meeting. We'll do our best to admit you as soon as possible. If by chance everything goes haywire or maybe we get a little extra visit this evening um, and you lose your connection, uh, the presentation will be shared via all of our social uh, media platforms and will be posted on our YouTube channel. It takes us about a week or so to get everything live on social media. Throughout the talk tonight, we invite you to use the chat box to submit questions that you may have for Jade and Elise. And if time allows, they'll answer all of your questions at the end of their presentation. If time gets away from us, we'll post their answers on social media over the course of the next week. And at this time, I'd like to introduce artist Jay Louder, who's here to give us insights into his current uh, show here at the Emerson, Liminal Strangeness, currently on exhibit in the Weaver Room through November. And Elise Adams joining us from the Bozeman Paranormal Group this evening. For the first time tonight, you're welcome to leave your cameras on. Uh, we'll begin the evening with, with a seance, and then we'll move into a discussion about Jade's work and space. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jade and Elise. Thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. and, and, uh, and creating this virtual space. So it's a very different kind of space to be doing this kind of talk tonight. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, and the chance to be able to partner with Elise at uh, Bozeman Paranormal. Now I'll definitely let you kind of introduce yourself a little bit uh, um, and whatnot. And into our kind of introductory performance, our introductory um how do you want to describe what we're about to do, Elise? Well, we're about to do a little bit of a seance. I'm going to introduce you to some of the equipment here um, and whatnot. I am going to invite everybody here to either open a little bit of a window and also to think about positive and happy thoughts while we do this, because you do not want I'm sorry, but you could bring negativity into your home, even doing a little seance from my house. So, um, yeah, I just want everybody to just feel light and love while we do the seance. So I'm just saying open your window or door and just kind of invite a spirit in um, and we'll just kind of go from there. But then I'm also going to bring up a piece of equipment here. Um, this is my pretty much my ghost box or spirit box. And it usually scans the radio really fast and usually, and spirits will talk through the radio. Actually, you will know what they're gonna say because they usually slow it down to their time um, through. This is also our little key box to it. It's called a wonder box or a portal. Um, it helps enhance the answers to the spirit box. And then I also thought I'd introduce a little friend here today. I do own a haunted doll. Her name is Sissy or Florence. She is a very active doll. She is very kind. She's not like Annabelle. Everybody thinks she is. Um, and she just is an attention seeking person. So I really, really enjoy talking to her. So if you do hear her, that's pretty much 
might be the only spirit we hear through the whole evening. I already opened up the doors for us. So before we even started this, so I'm trying to be that. And then when we close this, we all have to think closing thoughts. Like you have to be like, yes, I want to close it. So we're about to turn this on. You're gonna hear a little feedback. I'm not sure if I'm hearing anything right now, at least. And if anybody has a question, please feel free to ask as well, because I could turn this down for a minute, give you guys a little time to ask me a question. So I think a, a good opening question would be, you know, if we're, if we're working on communicating, you know, through your space and through um, Sissy, right? Yeah, sissy. Okay. So, um, I think like a fair opening question would just be like, you know, is there any message that sissy would like to? Yeah, yeah definitely. Is sissy, sissy, do you have a message for us? Yeah, definitely. And Elise, you might have to you might have to shout out if you hear a response in, in form of a word because I don't know if if we're hearing it or not. Yeah, no, I think that Zoom is maybe filtering that noise. Lisa, are you hearing any any kind of responses or anything like that? Has anything kind of come I through? I'm totally hearing a man's response right now, which is making me unnerving because they're out over there. I did open the space. So what happens when you open the space a little bit with the sound is you're inviting everything in the surrounding area to come talk. So sometimes Sissy will talk through everybody, but right now it's a man talking. So like this man mm -hmm. said, I asked if Sissy was here and this, this man clearly said no. <laughs> Oof, that's, well, that that's a little alarming. So I was like, oh, but when I had this on earlier, it was totally going through. So have you gotten like a man's voice from your space before? Or is yeah. it primarily like always sissy? So at least we are only hearing you when you face forward, but perhaps if you gave us like a thumbs up when you're hearing something, we can yeah. hit a little harder. Oh yeah. Because we, as soon as you turn your face sideways, we can't hear anything. Okay. Mm. What are you hearing right now, Elise? Yeah, I'm still not really able to hear much from it. 
So if you could just act as kind of maybe a little bit of our interpreter as we kind of wind down the. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to turn this off since you guys are having difficulties. I have. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Apparently I thought that was going to work. So anyways, just yeah, like all I was hearing was a man talking the whole time. And it's like, Every time I would ask if Sissy was here, it sounded like a man was going, no, she's not here, or no at all. So, and he would, whatever was in here was not giving me a name at all. And that's what pretty much, usually this works. I usually do Zoom with this and Facebook. So, but yeah, but pretty much, that's pretty much what a seance is, is you're just bringing in an object and inviting somebody in, and then you just listen to the static sounds. So, are there other other methods that you have kind of done besides like the Wonder Box and Steer Box? We've done like we have had the K two on here before, and she's played with it, um, but that which is an EMF meter, which is electrode magnetic field. That's what apparently what they think spirits are based off of. And that's also triggered her a little bit, but that's not really, she usually is very talkative most of the time. So, yeah. This is what the, the, so the spirit box and the application through the, the wonder box yes. is yes. kind of like how you bridge that gap, I guess? Yes. Interesting. Yes. Okay. I get what yes. you're saying. Super cool. Yes. But yeah, that's pretty much what you would do for a seance. I'm sorry, everybody. This was our attention of using the Wonder Box through Zoom. And uh, bear with us, but yeah. <laughs> what do we What do we need to do to to close out, Elise? So closing is usually you have to think just positive thoughts, and then telling anything that's in your area. And I want you all to do this because. Even okay. though I did open it with the Wonder Box, it still is entering your home. So, right. so because in in, in in theory, right, that man's voice could, could have be, been from anybody. Yeah, it could have been from anybody's home right now. So okay. I just want, is probably <laughs> pretty okay. much I want you to be pretty much saying this is what I'm going to even say to myself right now. Anything that is in my home needs to leave. Visitation hours is over. So pretty much is that's how you would close, close it. So that's what you all should be saying to yourself at this very moment. Okay. So anything in this space, uh, it's time to leave. Yes. Visiting hours have ended. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for, for walking us through that, Elise, and answering uh, questions. On and at that. least we, we tried the, the Wonder Box. At least maybe you guys did, some of you guys did hear some answers. So let's, let's hope. Totally. And if you, if you did, feel free to drop those in the chat as well if you heard anything. Uh, and then when we get to the, you know, kind of latter half of, uh, you know, the kind of talk tonight, we can maybe uh, um, talk through some of those ideas that we were hearing as well in addition to questions. So that would be super fun. Yeah, but if you guys were having experiences in your home while we were opening up a seance, we would like to know if you were having something that has happening in, in your room at that moment. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and start um, the slideshow now. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Perfect. There we are. Welcome. And moving through, as I think we kind of talked to this again, uh, this talk is kind of in connection to um, my show, Luminal Strangeness, which is open in the Weaver Room at the Emerson Center for Arts and Culture. Um, the Weaver Room is the kind of upstairs gallery space, um, which is where I'm standing currently, which is interesting as well. Um, we'll, all, we'll be talking a lot about space tonight, and I think it's 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 kind of interesting to kind of be doing this. I'm off in like a little corner of the room. Uh, there's a computer and uh, all these lights in front of me and whatnot. And it's a very interesting way to kind of interact with the show. Um, so um, if you haven't seen the show, you know, it's, it's up for a little while longer. So uh, please come on down. Um, cool. So um, in kind of getting started with the talk tonight, I, want, I like to start here. This is 
a uh, piece that I, I created for the for the the, um, the exhibition. Instead of doing a typical show card or like a postcard or something like that, um, part of my work outside of just the paintings I've been doing um, is comic books and making comics. And I wanted to make a comic book version of my artist statement and the show card. Um, and so I interjected a lot of personal narrative, um, a lot of things that kind of like deal with major themes that are in the show that I hope to kind of talk about a little bit tonight um, and, and, and address you know, potentially the title of the show, maybe some other stuff. Um, this is the inside of that very piece right there. So this is the kind of uh, the, the spread in the center there. That is a way of me kind of transitioning my, um, my artist statement into a narrative form um, and applying images to it. Cool. Um, and this is one of the paintings that are like, I think it's right, it's right behind me. So um, yeah, um, jumping into kind of conversation tonight and whatnot. Um, so number one, I'm Jade Lauder. Um, I'm an artist living here in Bozeman, Montana. I teach at MSU um, as an adjunct instructor um, in drawing. Um, I've taught painting, I've taught uh, a seminar, which is kind of like a, a theory course. Um, I've also taught undergraduate seminar to all incoming freshmen campus-wide. Uh, so I do a lot of you know, jumping around and teaching a bunch of different um, topics and subjects uh, through the arts or just kind of liberal arts uh, on campus. Um, and my uh, um, basic body of work has been really focused for a while on this idea of how we connect with spaces. And so um, if you are at all kind of like in the weeds in terms of like, why are we doing a seance in connection to a body of artwork? Don't worry, I hope to chat about some of those ideas and kind of uh, um, walk through my thinking behind um, the work that I make and what that connection actually is. Um, at least at this time, I, I wanna ask you a quick question. Um, I wanna ask you my first question. So. Elise, you want to give just a quick, because uh, I don't think we introduced who you are in, in connection and everything. So if you want to uh, quickly give like a little, uh, uh, you know, synopsis of who you are, and what you do, and then I'll ask you this kind of first question. Well, I am the founder of Bozeman Paranormal Society. We are a nonprofit here in Bozeman, Montana. Um, we do ghost investigations to home investigations, to even community-based things like ghost tours and just going to ghost towns and cemeteries um, and a bunch of things with history and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm always doing stuff that's usually my group thing. So, but yeah. Awesome, awesome, super cool. Okay, here's my first question. So um, what are some locations um, that you've investigated that you feel a connection with? My first one has to be Bannock. Um, I really feel very connected to Bannock. Every year we have to go camping there. Um, it's like a home feeling for me. I just feel like spiritually like connected to this place. My second biggest place I feel like I'm connected to because I've had a really intense, I guess, intense experience there. Um, you would have to listen to it later on but it's virginia city and we've had so many investigations there and have had so many experiences i actually listed ted's number one most haunted place in montana uh just because every time we go there we always have an experience so and those have to be my two most connected places in montana because i always am going there and trying to just connect yeah that's awesome i definitely um I can't remember if I've been to Bannock or not. I think maybe as like a kid on a film field trip, maybe, but I don't remember. Um, Virginia City, I definitely have spent time in, and I like, I can get that. There's there's history to that town for sure, and like you, you walk downtown into certain buildings, and you can, you, I mean, you know, you can kind of feel that that, um, you know, not just the history but the stories that are kind of like connected to a lot of those spaces. Yeah, totally. Um, so kind of moving through some of the other paintings. This one's also <laughs> in the show. Uh, I think it's behind me as well. Um, but so 
this connection of space and identity is something that I've been kind of working on and thinking about in my paintings for quite some time. Um, and I, I asked that kind of question of Elise because that connection, that idea of a connection between place and people and, and you know, what we kind of think of when we think of those, those connections. Um, I have, I, I kind of am on the spectrum to believe that there's something more or, or more deeply uh, um, rooted about those intersections of place and identity. And I kind of want to talk about those a little bit. So um, this is an example of the work that I did in graduate school. So in graduate school, I kind of like was really starting to uh, pull out some of these ideas of how I interacted with space. And what I would do is I would create these installations where I encouraged the viewer um, to view the work in a very specific way to kind of manipulate that interaction to get them to see how I connect with spaces, how I think about places. Um, and I would do that, you know, not just through the paintings that I would make, um, whether or not that's the, the kind of looseness of the paint uh, to kind of reflect that idea of maybe, you know, uh, quickness of, of photos, of, of quickly looking at a space of, uh, um, you know, this was from a series of work I did called Peripheral. And these paintings were all about that speed of seeing something out of the corner of your eye and, um, and, and then me going back into the studio and taking a little bit longer to kind of reflect through why it was so um, eye catching out of the corner of my eye. Um, this body work again is that same, same uh, series from graduate school where I was working through how to manipulate the viewer and have them have a very specific kind of like experience with the work. So the, the piece on the left um, is this idea of uh, uh, the painting is behind this wall. Like I built a wall in front of the painting. So the only way to like really see the painting is to kind of peer around the wall. Um, and the idea there is that I was spending a lot of time in airports during that year. And, um, you know, in the airports, your view, what you can see, how you interact with the space is very controlled. So I want to make a piece that kind of had that, that kind of level of control. Um, the piece on the right um, was in a drive through art gallery. And so I wanted to create a painting that was uh, supposed to be viewed from a car, so like from a car window. Um, and so I wanted to kind of elongate it, um, kind of like referring back to um, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, where the bulletin boards uh, are kind of like super stretched. And so the image itself is also like a little bit stretched there. And I kind of created this, this kind of bulletin board uh, for people to kind of view from their car windows. So again, it's thinking about how we, you know, um, place and identity are linked and how we, how I can kind of think about creating that linkage through visual cues. Which kind of takes me to this newer body of work that, uh, that is kind of representative of the stuff in, that's in the gallery. Um, and as I kind of like mentioned a little bit in my artist, and if you haven't read it, it's, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I kind of opened that, that comic with the first line, our ability to connect with spaces is in trouble. And I think that's true. I think spaces and how we relate to them are changing so quickly and our environments change so quickly and through different media, different ways in which we uh, interact with those spaces, whether or not that's like literally through our phones or through you know, uh, social media or through, through whatever, um, that interaction and that closeness with space is in flux at the very least, if not directly in trouble. Um, and so the work that I'm making, and I'll kind of get to why it is what it is, is kind of in response or reaction to stuff like this. So I, I kind of like think of this image as like nowhere. Um, I think if to the right, you can kind of see that like there's some clues as to where this actually is, but for all intents and purposes, this could be anywhere. There's nothing specific in this image that tells you where it is. Um, there's nothing that feels like home. There's nothing that feels like a place where you want to spend time in. It's a, it's a you know, passage between two places. It's, it's nothing. It's meaningless. It's vapid. Um, and it doesn't give us a sense of connecting. And this is what our environments are turning into. And like uh, um, 
it's, it's happening more and more. And we're seeing this a lot more. A lot of our spaces are being commodified in this kind of way. And, and our ability to connect is second to our ability to spend. And I think that like that can create a lot of like uh, dysfunction. And then I look at spaces like this. And yes, there's still all like some of those problems in this space as well, but through architecture, through different means, we're starting to build up a narrative where this place is of a connection of, of how we can fit into the space, how we see ourselves in the space. Um, and I think that's like, that's interesting that just through like how we think about our design, um, these spaces change. So a lot of the reading and a lot of stuff that I do um, kind of prior to this current body of work has had a lot to do with architecture, um, designing spaces, and thinking through that disconnect there. But I've always felt that those kind of uh, um, readings and that kind of research has always been kind of wanting. You know, when I've been painting those ideas, I think I can only ever go so far because I, I firmly believe that there's something more with spaces. There's something that architectural theory that all that kind of stuff just glances the surface of and it doesn't dig in. And I think that's where it leads me into thinking about paranormal investigation. Um, and this, this kind of idea that I have about paranormal investigation and its connection to space and identity is this, that the people who are actually looking into spaces the way that I'm thinking about spaces, thinking about the phenomenological connection of place and identity are paranormal investigators because they go into a space and they think, what else is there? What's more to this space? It's not just the brick and mortar of the space, but there's what, what else is there? Uh, and I think that that question is, is what kind of propels me into this work, what, what, what makes me think about uh, um, paranormal investigators as being like the true investigators of space. Um, and so, um, Ellie, like I'm gonna jump into some more questions because I've been talking for forever, but um, so what types of spaces do you investigate most frequently? Slash, what's the oldest man-made structure you've investigated? We actually go to the Sacagawea Hotel a lot. Um, and we also go to Livingston Depot a lot, um, Phillipsburg Opera House, Clark Chateau, Bannock, and Virginia City often. Those are probably our top of our list. I'm not getting like Santa Julia has to be number one. We literally go there every year. That's like our winter investigation because we have nothing else really going on. And that has to be my most, um, you know, like one that we go to and whatnot. And what was the second part of the question? What, yeah, sorry. What, what was the oldest man-made structure you investigated? It has to either be like one of the buildings of Bannock or Clark Chateau, because Clark Chateau is also a really old building that the Clarks, um, one of the Copper Kings owned in Butte, and they gave a, the, that building to one of their sons um, as a wedding gift. So... And it's one of the oldest structures we've been to, or it could have been Dumas Brothel. It's probably also one of our oldest ones we've been in. Is that in Butte as well? Yes. Gotcha. It's the oldest running brothel in America. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I think I, I literally just listened to a podcast about, about that. <laughs> about we just that investigated space. there. and We actually just investigated there early October. Oh, really? Wow, super cool. Um, so follow up to that, like why do you think the like you investigate those spaces most frequently? Like, like let's like zoom in on the Sacagawea Hotel because I've been there and it's a like amazingly beautiful building, number one. Um, why why that space? Why do you think? I always think I feel like I'm connected to that space anyways, just like because I just love the history to it, for one. Um, and that it's one of the most active hotels um, in this side of the state. Like it really is. And I feel for me, I'm always trying to make a connection with spirits most of the time. Like I'm literally one of those people. Hey, you want to be my friend? <laughs> so and to me, I feel like. 
they're my friends. So usually I'm just going to visit them. It's mostly our group is a very historical group. So we're always trying to dig more history into it because there is some history that's kind of mystery. They don't know a lot of like some of the people that died in there. They don't know a lot of the connections to that. So we're always going there to find more connections. So yeah, to their history line. So there, I, I think this is a good point to me to like break down the title of my show. Cause I think maybe I talked to you a little bit about this like in, 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 in conversation, but so the title of the show is called Liminal Strangeness. And it's it, like strangeness comes from the, like the ideas of John Keel um, and his investigation in um, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. But liminal is like re in regard to a type of space, a space yeah. that like accurately describes Sacagawea Hotel, a liminal space. Liminal space meaning it's a, it's a transitionary space. It's not somewhere where we're supposed to like spend a ton of time. A hotel, that's like a temporary lodging. Yeah. Like people are moving in and out of there. If you just think about like how many people have stayed in that hotel and, and how many people have, you know, uh, potentially, you know, you know, died in that hotel. Like, I think that that alone makes it a, a, a fascinating place story-wise, history-wise, and exactly what you're saying. Um, so I think that like, yeah, like I like breaking that apart right there because that kind of like lent itself really well is that like that idea of liminal spaces I think are really interesting. And every time I start talking about space, I end up using the same language as like paranormal investigation, like connecting to space, opening myself up to space, engaging with space or anything like that. I keep finding that's like yeah, how I think about it ends up kind of being this kind of cross-pollinated way of, of, of thinking about like paranormal research and whatnot. Um, which leads me to, I wanted to kind of like talk a little bit about, um, the first investigation I ever went on, because when I started making this series of paintings, um, I, I, I wanted to, you know, when I was thinking, all right, I'm going to start working on ideas about paranormal investigation and how they overlap with this idea of place and identity. I felt like I had to go on an investigation so that I could like get that better sense of how it works and feel like I had that ownership of it, of, of knowing, you know, of knowing the ins and outs a little bit. So I went on an investigation to the Red Lodge Historical Society Museum um, with a group called Montana Paranormal Research, um, and they're out of Billings. Um, and I connected with a guy through, through that, and we went on an overnight investigation and I have stories from that space, but it was, it, uh, uh, what I really learned from this is I took my own photos and I tried to paint and draw and use those photos that I took and they were, they didn't work. They were trash. Like they, they just didn't work. Uh, and I think what, what happened was because I was looking at them differently. I was looking at the photos you know, and making a photograph, like thinking about the composition, making sure that it had the right amount of lighting and I wanted to, you know, set a mood and stuff like that. Whereas the photos I was like so taken by about, you know, paranormal research in the first place had none of that, had none of that staging, had none of those concerns about aesthetics. It was something else. Um, so at least at, like, I also want to ask before I move on to the next one, um, what was your, what was your first investigation? And was there anything memorable that you can kind of like uh, pull out of that memory? Well, first, our first investigation was Copper King Hotel and Convention Center in Butte, Montana. And the connection to it was it was our first like literally that month I just made the group. And a little story about the group is the group actually came to me in a dream, the, the name and everything. And it just pretty much like gave me a calling and ever since we've been together for 10 years so that that week i'm like we have to go on an investigation and we have to make shirts and we have to do things so i started contacting places and i thought i was contacting the copper king mansion which that was not true but we ended up scoring a pretty active hotel anyways this hotel is not a very old old hotel it is dated back to the 80s um, and it has had some crazy um, kind of experiences. A little girl slipped and 
and fell um, in the pool and she ended up dying. Um, there's been a couple suicides in the building um, and they've had a couple other just strange things from like a man even walking in cowboy boots. Well, we were in there and I didn't have very many, much equipment. So I had only a flip video camera and a voice recorder. That's all. And actually the flip video cameras are one of my favorite cameras to use as a ghost hunter because they have the best audio on ever. <laughs> and, um, and we're just setting that up and we were up in over by, there was like a convention center and there was like a, a glass wall and there was a, it was facing the, the pool and there was a slide well we were all into it and whatnot and then when i went through the evidence we caught a little girl going down the slide and to me it was just memorable because this is our first ever i've ever gotten ghost hunting ever it was just one of those things like i'm here and i'm doing this and i'm with these people and they're doing this with me and then later on we caught one of our best pieces of evidence still to this day We've been a 10 year group and it's probably one of the best pieces of evidence we've ever caught because we caught a shadow of a little girl going down the slide. There's a man doing cleaning the pool that has no idea. You can hear a little girl talking in Spanish and yeah, while this is happening. So to me, that is a connection to this little girl is is connected to this pool space mm -hmm. and it's stuck there. So and yeah, man, that's that's super interesting. I like that that idea of like you know we're out and we're doing it and it's happening. It, it, yeah, and kind of just you know, <laughs> it's ever since. Kind of, yeah, I, I, I love that that sense of kind of group and, and camaraderie with that. Um, it, it, it reminds me like uh, when I was doing my first investigation, I had like a little digital audio recorder. Uh, kind of running like the entire night through setup through the entire like you know investigation and everything and um, with total plans to like go back and re-listen to it and then there's like it's like an eight hour audio file and I've like never gone back and listened to it because it's eight hours but um, during that time like I asked and kind of like did like kind of pseudo interviews with uh, the other investigators and kind of like asking, you know, why they do what they do, why are they doing, you know, this versus that, and that kind of stuff. And it was it was super cool. And they were all like really open to asking questions. I was like really worried about like stepping on toes and like, you know, forgive me for asking this and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, it was it was super good to kind of get that like handle on what it means and, and what what that kind of stuff looks like. Um, so continuing on a little bit, belief. Um, cause I think that's the other kind of part with this, um, beyond the connection with space and whatnot. I think what I found out about my work is that there's always been this underlying current of questioning belief and questioning the meaning. Um, part of that, that, that comic was that I did for, uh, the show card was a little bit about my dad. My dad passed away last year. Um, and it was right during like the peak of COVID and it was, it was just a really not great experience. Um, and it, it really kind of shook me and it had me thinking a lot more, those kind of deeper questions, I think is, you know, mortality and all that, all that always does. Um, but I think the other thing that it did was made me really kind of connect to this, these feelings about my dad and about, um, what he was always doing through his life. And I, um, my dad, whenever he would see my art, uh, this is kind of like an aside, but it tells a lot about him and about, about me. He would always look for hidden images in my art. He would say, oh, I see, I see all these faces back here. And, all, and I'm like, dad, I didn't paint those things. <laughs> you're, 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 you're going off on a tangent that's not relevant at all to what I'm like, what I'm trying to do. But uh, that was him. And why I bring it up is because he was always searching for meaning. He looked at, at, at everyday things and found meaning out of everything. And he would always try and impart, impart that. And so I think that like through this work of trying to find meaning through place and identity, paranormal stuff, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff, I found that kind of connection with him, that idea of I'm also searching for meaning. And I don't know exactly what the meaning I'm looking for is and what those answers are, but I'm definitely questioning. And so, um, 
looking at that and thinking about those those questions, Elise, I have another one for you. Um, this one is probably like the big one I want to ask you. Like, I think this is the biggest, meatiest question. Um, so what do you believe is the connection between spaces and people? Um, and, and what does that look like? To me, I feel like I was thinking about this question earlier. So I kind of wanted to connect it to um, an experience I had prior to this was a person that was alive um, years ago. His name is Pablo Elvira. Um, he is an opera singer. And what I always try to, to do is see if spirits are happy where they are or if they want to be passed. Well, this spirit alone is very happy where he is in the Rialto Theater. So I always feel like people, you know, if you love something so much, if you love that space, if you, that's where you want to be, that's where you're going to end up as even in death. If you spend that much time, like at home, enjoying something, that's something that you're connecting with in that space in that way. Well, Pablo was that way. Um, he's still spirit at the, the Rialto. That was his favorite place to play opera. I know this because I had a psychic, her name was Kathleen Johns, um, come to our latest investigation. Um, and she definitely pretty much connected that, that interest. She said that he, she is very happy there. Um, and he will, he just, Cher and I kind of share the same beliefs because I feel like if a spirit is very happy in their location, they'll stay there. And I feel like even people in a lot alive, if we like for me, I love going to the tea house and I like connecting with my friends and I love connecting with my family and having that memory of being and playing games, laughing, doing fun things and just connecting and realizing that that's where your space is. So that's kind of how I see people and connecting. And that's why I thought I'd bring up also the, the spirit aspect to it too. No, I, 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 I like that kind of reasoning of, of that, that love for a space. So do, do you think that like the tea house would be potentially like one of those spaces that you would like haunt? Uh, yes, for people that I'm business partners with over there. Yes, I probably <laughs> would. I do dress as a Mad Hatter often. So I probably would also <laughs> linger at the tea house. You'd be seen as, yeah. as a the Mad Hatter there? Gotcha. That, gotcha. Or, that or it's Bannock, because that's where I want my ashes to go, because I have a connection there as a spiritual mm. being, uh, going there and feeling connected there spiritually, because that's also another way of connecting to space is spiritually connecting to it. Even in being a living person, you can connect to a space spiritually as well. So for me, I love tea. So that would might be a place where I would not, or sure. I would be going to my favorite place on earth, which is Bannock. Gotcha. Yeah, like I think that like, that becomes kind of a tough question for me, that like idea of like, is there a space that I love so much or that I connect with so much? And I don't know that I have that answer. I think that like part of the reason I make the work that I make is because I like desperately want to connect to spaces. And I think maybe, you know, like um, as a kid, I moved around a lot. And so I think that I've always kind of like tried to quickly connect with a space. And it, it's kind of like, again, that, that the whole search for meaning, I think I pack a lot of meaning into spaces and I put a lot of pressure to be able to like do that, to connect with the space. And I think most of the time I, I just don't. And I, 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 I kind of like am fascinated and, and love when people are able to connect to spaces, which is probably why you know greater reason of why i make the work that i make um yeah. and then i was talking about these two pieces with you i've been kind of cycling through images as we've been kind of talking here just to kind of keep things moving um images in the show um part of the other kind of parts that i, I want to uh, um, briefly talk about because i know we're running a little long um is that like these two pieces are physical connections with with space i guess where um like i was telling you at least when i was kind of talking about these paintings these are representations of this very specific kind of paranormal photo of people showing where they've been scratched or or you know uh, touched by something otherworldly right um and the title of the pieces i've kind of like 
link them back to um, these these cults uh, because I'm trying to kind of like think about those connections again of fringe beliefs and about is there anything to do with place? You know, I, I think I, I picked three. Um, I think I only showed two in the slideshow, but there's three paintings and they each kind of like refer to a different cult in a different space specifically where that cult is kind of was most prevalent. And I think that like, again, it's that same thing. It's like maybe, you know, love, I think where you, the, the space you love, I like that idea a lot. It feels very, very, very wholesome. But I think there's like also that, that potential there for it to be the other way around too, where you focus maybe a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of emotion. And I think those spaces can maybe be charged then. Um, whether or not that's normally speaking, you know, spiritually, or if that's just like the history of that space. I mean, regardless of, of thinking about, you know, uh, the, the spiritual connection, you know, we were talking about Virginia City. Walking down Virginia City, you can still feel that history. And it's not just the architecture. It's it's like that whole space has that kind of feel of of like you're walking into that kind of history. Um, and I think that has to do a lot with that space. Um, cool. <laughs> Down the rabbit hole. So a lot of this research and whatnot has led me to some really interesting, weird stuff uh, that I wasn't prepared for. And that uh, like, you know, so the, the, like I kind of mentioned at the top of the talk about that idea of liminal strangeness, these liminal spaces in connection with strangeness. So the strangeness, pull that apart really quickly from the, uh, from the title of the show, is taken from this concept from John Keel who wrote The Mothman Prophecies, which was, which was about his investigation in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, 1966 to 1967, which culminated in this image here, which is the collapse of the Silver Bridge, which, which spanned the Ohio River. Um, and all of his research and whatnot in this area, he was, uh, before going into this, a journalist. And he really didn't have too many like dips into the paranormal until this. This was his kind of like big moment of like bringing him in. And he coined this phrase, high strangeness, to kind of like talk about this idea of like multiple weird things happening all at once. Um, and I take that title, that, that, that usage of strangeness, and think about multiple weird things. Because I think that like within the work that I'm making, these paintings and whatnot, um, I'm considering a multitude of weirdness, of strangeness, um, kind of packing them in beyond just, you know, like, like it, the work comes from, like, obviously, if it's not obvious now, paranormal investigation photographs, um, but the other kind of search for meaning, the idea of connection of uh, place and identity, the paintings themselves, I'm packing a lot of stuff into them that I'm, I'm interested in, I'm questioning. And that takes me back to paint. I, I'm probably gonna skip one question, at least just for time's sake, and kind of get to that, uh, to that point. And then wrapping this all up with paint. Um, painting is how I think. I process information through painting, the act of painting um, and creating images. It's how my brain lets me process um, dense things. And, and instead of me just writing down and asking questions, this is how I question the world. This is how I question the things that I care about, the questions, the things that make me angry, that upset me, um, that I'm fascinated by, all that kind of stuff. Um, I question through my painting in this, the, the act of painting. Um, and so my, my final question for you, um, Elise, um, why do the work that you do? Like what keeps you motivated to keep doing it? Well, one, this is like my most passionate thing. I love, I love spirits and everything, but it's mostly the history. I love, a lot of people are always trying to find answers, right? Well, for me, it's connecting history with spirits. Most of the questions I'll be like asking are, is what's your name? Can you, most of my favorite thing is asking is, what's your story? And then like telling me your story, what year it is, and just kind of try and connect that that history and then i'm always inviting my members and uh, to that join they might not always want to do the history thing but sometimes it's just for them it's connecting what they want out of the paranormal maybe it's some closure it's some other things it's a skepticism 
But for me, it's really just history. But if you know me, I am the most passionate person with the paranormal. I am like always doing something for the group all the time. So, and that's what really motivates me. Every day I get up, I'm like, okay, it's time to email this person or let's prep this equipment. It's always getting ready to do something. It keeps me going. Awesome. Super cool. Um, kind of like turning that question a little bit on, on, <laughs> on me. Um, yeah, I think like uh, the, the big motivation is just like, again, um, I'm an artist. I make things. I think through making and that's, that's, that's a big, like, you know, it's, it's as second nature as, you know, breathing or anything like that. I, I have to make things. Um, and the stuff that I choose to make is about where my head's at. And so like, I kind of follow where my, my mind is. Um, and I was kind of thinking about this of like, what's motivating me right now. And, and like, um, currently I'm taking, um, some comic book classes, um, online and it's been like hugely energetic for the studio, like this, looking at these new ways to make art and, and to think about how to tell stories. And I've been really engaged in that and then thinking about, okay, okay, how can I take the ideas that I'm interested in my paintings and translate those into potentially like comic form um, and other forms and maybe, you know, uh, um, how can I then take the comics and turn them into paintings and backwards and forwards and backwards. And so that like idea of making and, and questioning things is, is, is definitely what keeps uh, me, uh, uh, moving forward as well. Um, cool. So we are <laughs> right at the end. I think that's a, a fairly good spot. I know that I probably, um, had more stuff I wanted to kind of talk about. So that's, that's okay. That's always the kind of nature of any kind of talk. Um, so if there's questions, uh, from the audience, I see in the chat, there's a couple of things, um, Please feel free to ask whatever um, I can talk through painting processes. I can talk through what painters I'm looking at or artists and stuff like that. Um, um, we can talk about if, if there was anything paranormal happening in that seance earlier in anybody's homes. I know Elise and myself would be really interested to hear that. So um, Susan, what, what do we got? Dave, let me just interject really quickly. I love that idea if anybody had any experiences tonight. Uh, that happened in their home during the seance, so please drop them in the chat. We'd love to know more about that. Um, before we go on to a couple questions, I just want to do a shameless plug for Elise. And tonight at 9 p.m., they're doing uh, Halloween ghost stories and history. And the link for that is currently in the chat, so be sure that you grab that. That is tonight, right? Yes. Okay. Nine. And uh, for folks joining across the country, that link will work for you wherever you are as well. Um, Jade, I have to ask the question because I find it fascinating in listening to uh, both you and Courtney Bolzon, whose work is also on display at the Emerson right now, a little bit about that process. And I was fascinated to hear both of you um, talk about doing all of the research, right? And then what you actually do when it's time, time to paint. And I was humored by your answer that uh, you like to talk on the phone. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, I was kind of explaining that the other day that like, um, I found that like, is, is I don't know, it's, it, maybe it sounds weird, but um, sometimes in the, the creative process, I like to get my, that critic out of my head and, um, and just kind of turn off and get to that kind of, it's, it's almost, um, it's this idea called creative flow. Um, and so like art, different artists have different ways of kind of getting into it different artists have different like stimuli they like to like take in when they're working and to kind of get them to that headspace i've found recently that one thing that really like helps me is talking on the phone and so i end up like calling my brother and we just like talk um and we'll talk for like hours while i'm painting or while i'm drawing um and it's it's it, it sounds weird because it makes me feel like I'm such an old person. <laughs> like I just, I, I really want like the corded phone and I want to uh, like, that's what I want, but it's just my, myself. But like, uh, uh, I really want to like have that kind of like uh, um, <laughs> uh, relation to it. But like the whole idea is that like through talking, I'm not over analyzing things that are going on in the paintings and I can kind of remove myself a little bit and just react to what's happening. Um, on the surface instead of like getting too nitty gritty. 
put your cell phone on speaker and then get yourself one of the corded phones that you can just tug around. <laughs> just as a prop? Yeah, I think that <laughs> just kind of put it in the, that, that, that nook of my shoulder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> really fascinating. And um, I was going to say as a former educator and somebody that's trained in how people learn and how people store and process information, I'm absolutely fascinated by by you and your process, um, because it's just a testament that that your brain can do more than one thing at the same time, and it's really just a really uh, I don't know I'm intrigued by um, by our ability to put such powerful work out while we have some awkward stimuli happening, you know, a phone conversation or you're streaming something and paying attention to weird images on the side. I find it fascinating. Um, sure. The chat, Sophia has asked, what initially influenced you to pursue art and what has drawn you to your medium of painting? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I can't remember a time where I didn't make art. Like, I think there was always just my path. Um, I think from an, like a really early age, I think my mom still tells this story. Like she can remember my first drawing. And she, ha I think she has it somewhere, but I, I don't know. Um, but it was the picture, of, it was a drawing of Godzilla, like destroying a city. And that was like my first thing I ever did. Uh, and, and I think that like, you know, to, to, to uh, not to get too like granular about it, but like that was, it became a way where I could communicate where, you know, I'm like the middle kid in my, in my family. So like my voice often got overshadowed or there was louder voices than mine. Um, but one way that was like surefire, I could communicate to my family, to friends, to whoever was through art, through making things. And so that became like an early age thing. I just always did that. And then I always made comics. Um, that was my other kind of inroad is I made comics as soon as I like knew what a comic book was, I was making comics, um, from, you know, kind of copying other characters and stuff like that, or making up my own very bad characters <laughs> that never really went on to do anything. Um, that was kind of like where, where that, that first started. Um, what was the other, what was the other part of the question, Susan? Drawn you to your medium. I think, you know, what. So, you know, the medium of painting, what drew you to that? But it's basically making art. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that like, I think drawing was always just like, felt really natural to me. Um, but then once I kind of like, um, I got to college and I started painting, because I, I really didn't paint as a kid. That was just not like, I just didn't have really access to paints like we just didn't in my household i always had reams of paper but that was just an easily accessible thing um but then when i got to college i took my first painting class and just something something clicked there was just some part of my brain that was just like ready for for that and it just clicked and it just made sense to me um and so like now like i like drawing with a brush anytime i can like i think you know um i think through images and whatnot in that kind of layered way, similar to painting. Um, and I think I, I compare everything else, even drawing to painting at this point. So I feel like it was just this medium I, I came across, you know, through school and then it just, it just stuck. So Jade, we have time for one more question. Before we do that, I'm gonna ask if you want to advance your slides, because I don't oh, want sure. to run out of that. Yeah. Um, this is that final page of my comic book. So if anybody is looking where they, that they can uh, see more of my work, um, there's my Instagram right there or my website, um, as well as my Patreon, which you can uh, get weekly comic books. I, I, I create new stuff every week and, and submit it um, there. So, yeah. And then I also wanted to, I dedicated the show to my dad. Um, and I, there's a little hidden message down at the bottom there. You'll see the feather. And then below there, there's two signatures. The one on the left is kind of this anchor and that's my signature. And the one on the right is the Z and that's my dad's. He used that for everything. So I've wanted to sign it from both of us. So yeah, just, uh, I just wanted to point that out. That's lovely. Uh, Jade, one last question. Yeah. Asking, how can someone else find their painting process? Where, as just you said, you call your brother, 
<laughs> Any tips for helping others find what gets them into their flow? Yeah, that's a super good question. I think everybody does it differently. Um, I think that like flow and meditation are really close. They're like right on the edge there. Um, but that being said, you know, like most like meditation has you like sit with your hands forward or open or, or whatnot. Um, and you're to try and uh, like, you're trying to get to that, that, that empty space and you're not trying to move around a lot. I can't, I like when, when I meditate, I have to like be touching or, or, or moving my hands or drawing or just like scribbling. Like I have to do it. Like I can't not be fidgeting when I'm trying to get to that headspace. So I think like you've got to figure out for you, where is that, that kind of like sweet spot of, of that? And it's trial and error. That's, that's all it really kind of comes down to. Um, I know a lot of people love like, just like listening to music some people I know like nothing, like they got, it's gotta be quiet, perfectly quiet in the studio. And I think that you just gotta try a bunch of different stuff, throw, you know, throw that spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks and what stuff is gonna like give you that, that process. Um, I had a professor in grad school who would, uh, to, to get to his creative space, and this is gonna sound super far out, but this is what he did and he's a weird guy. So there you go. He would stand on one foot on a log, like a stump, and he would stand on one foot like a crane and, and, and he would journal like while he was doing it. And that like process of like forcing his body into a weird position for whatever reason, it just helped him just like quickly come up with those ideas and get into that creative headspace. And it like, he's a super weird dude and I love him to death. Uh, but that's, that was, what, that was his process. <laughs> he's got to have their thing. Jade, Elise, I want to thank you guys both for being here, uh, for starting tonight in the most unique way that the Emerson's ever started an artist talk. Uh, I think it's incredibly fitting for this virtual fit, virtual setting and for these um, less than normal times that we're in. So thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your expertise and your passion. Jade, thanks for sharing your work with us in the Emerson. Folks, if you get a chance and you can come to the Emerson, please stop by and see the shows. Jade's in the weaver room upstairs. And we have Courtney Blazon in the lobby and uh, Jesse Wilbur Gallery as well. They're beautiful. Um, please be safe, mask up, and uh, we will see you soon. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.